Now, yes, I would ask uh, a big round of applause of, to introduce our keynote speaker, Doug Madori of Kentucky, and he's going to talk about a brief history uh, of uh, the top, the biggest BGP incidents, the most colorful, the most fun in a way. So a round of applause for him. Let's uh, receive Doug Madori Hola. of Kentucky. As Carlos mentioned, my name is Doug Midori. I'm from Kentuck, and the title of my talk is A Brief History of the Internet's Biggest ABGP Incidents. So um, I'm happy to be at LACNIC. I love coming to LACNIC. I've got my LACNIC 19 uh, shirt from 10 years ago uh, today. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for inviting me down here, and um, I'm happy to give this, uh, this talk here today. So a little background on how this came to be. So last year in the United States, uh, the FCC, which is our federal agency for uh, communications, took an interest in BGP and wanted to solicit feedback from the industry about how to better improve security and operations. So this organization, BTAG, is a, is a group that uh, represents the broadband providers and ISPs of the, internet, of the United States. And they assembled a team of experts to write a long report, and uh, they kind of got everybody uh, in the BGP world uh, in the United States together of note, wrote a report with uh, recommendations and uh, some explanation of the problems. And uh, I was in that group. Uh, my main contribution was writing a little history. Uh, for someone who was new to the topic, uh, if we were to summarize what has been taking place over the last couple of decades in BGP, what would be the, the, the scenarios that you would, what would be the stories that you would tell? And uh, so I wrote that last year, and then I published it again this year just on my own uh, on the Kentic blog post. And then Carlos reached out and asked if, uh, if LACNIC could publish a translation in Spanish. So, para los hablantes de español, hay una versión. Maybe there's a version coming in Portuguese one day. Um, so uh, this, this talk loosely follows this. Obviously, there's a lot more in the, in the report. But this story of BGP begins uh, way, way back in ancient history in 1989. Um, at an ITF meeting during lunch, a couple of engineers sketched out a, uh, uh, this protocol on two napkins, three napkins, who knows? Uh, BGP was off to a, uh, a, a great start. Uh, these were the three, uh, three sides of two napkins, perhaps. Um, if you take nothing away from this talk, it's that we're going to need more napkins. All right, so why don't we stroll through the history of BGP incidents uh, and remember that what are the problems that were, uh, were getting caused by these incidents? We've got either a disruption of, of flow of internet traffic, legitimate traffic, or some sort of misdirection of communications that has got security implications, either interception, manipulation of traffic, and occasionally something can drift into two, uh, both of these, but usually it's kind of one or the other. And um, when I speak about uh, the, these range of incidents, I like to talk about a, uh, that they exist on a spectrum. Because some of these are hard and some of these are not as hard. Uh, and, and so that we have this spectrum of difficulty, of the degree of difficulty to mitigate some of these incidents. On one end, we've got the fat finger, just mistakes, uh, that our, our global system of routing needs to survive these types of mistakes on up to the other end of the spectrum is a determined adversary who deeply understands the weaknesses of our, uh, the security of our routing system and can take advantage of that to pull off an attack. Uh, so those are different, different uh, scenarios that we have to deal with. And when I started doing this and writing up uh, reports about these uh, types of incidents back in 2009, we were really not good at stopping anything on the spectrum. Now we've come a long way. So I like to, uh, Oh, there's a little animation that's not coming up here. But um, I like to uh, break up my, uh, how I talk about these uh, leaks, uh, when we talk about leaks, into origination and adjacency leaks. So the RC7908 uh, provides a taxonomy of a variety of different scenarios of, uh, of leak scenarios. You know, they define it broadly as a propagation of a routing announcement beyond its intended scope. 
Um, but I think it's helpful to break up into origination and adjacency. Adjacency includes taking a route from a transit provider, announcing it to another transit provider, from a peer to a transit provider, from a transit provider to a peer. There's a few different scenarios, but in all of them, uh, any kind of origin-based uh, filtering is just not going to help, and so you need something else, and that's where uh, ASPA uh, comes in. So with origin leaks, our very first routing leak that affected the internet was WAC in 1997. So this is the AS7007 incident. This was, the, uh, this was caused by a software bug in a router that caused the router to de-aggregate the entire global routing table and announce it as, I think, slash 24s. Um, what was especially bad about this was at the time when you removed, when they finally isolated the problem, uh, removed the, the problematic router, those routes were still in circulation. Uh, and we've come a long way of timing out things uh, that wouldn't happen today, but at the time, it, was, uh, it took a long time to remediate that issue. Uh, we've had a number of origination leaks since then. Um, we've got the Turk Telecom leak, China Telecom leak. This, this graphic on the, on the right is from a Nanog talk I gave three or four years ago where I was looking at some of these incidents and trying to look at how far do the routes propagate in a leak. So you, we, we would use these large figures of 100,000, 20,000 routes, uh, but really it's only the routes that uh, travel uh, and propagate the farthest that cause the most disruption. So uh, in this case, uh, because there was a lot of concern that this was some sort of a China attack, you know, I showed that most of the routes that actually were in circulation were other Chinese routes. Um, and uh, anyway, but there hasn't been a, a real bad debilitating origin leak for a long time, and I think uh, there's, a, there's good reason uh, why that hasn't been the case. Uh, there's also this kind of, uh, this a scenario, a category of incidents that bridges both uh, both the intentional and the accidental. So these incidents are both a particle and a wave. Uh, so the most famous incident here is the uh, Pakistan uh, trying to block YouTube. You're maybe you're probably familiar with this, um, but we've uh, so they announced they tried to black hole traffic within Pakistan. It leaked out, caused trouble uh, for YouTube globally. Well, we've seen this scenario. Uh, happened a number of times uh, since then, and uh, most recently with Twitter uh, during um, uh, during the both during the Myanmar uh, military coup in the spring of 2021, uh, they ordered a crackdown of social media and independent media. One of the ISPs uh, decided they would black hole uh, Twitter, um, and uh, uh, they did that via BGP. It leaked out, causing disruptions around South South Asia. And then uh, a year later, almost to the day, uh, in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia had a crackdown on social media, and they, they had almost the exact same scenario. An ISP uh, trying to black hole Twitter, uh, did it via BGP, and leaked it out to the internet. What was different between these two scenarios was that in the interim, in that year, uh, Twitter deployed RPI. So they created roads for all their routes, started dropping invalids, and the result was that the impact, uh, the disruption due to this accidental or intentional but also accidental uh, uh, leak was minimized. Um, and then again, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, uh, an order by the Iraqi government to block tel Telegram. Again, their government network started uh, hijacking, like locally black holing traffic. That leaked out. But again, because Telegram had ROAs, uh, the, the disruption was minimal outside of Iraq. So the other scenario I mentioned was the adjacency leaks. So the, this is when a, a provider you know, takes uh, routes from one, one party and sends it on to another that it shouldn't. So in the, the case of uh, Main One, this was a provider in uh, Nigeria that was taking uh, routes from uh, content providers, announcing it to its transit providers, China Telecom announced it to the rest of the world, causing some disruption to uh, some major content providers. You know, to their credit, within a couple of uh, hours, they publicly announced, hey, we, we messed up. Don't think this is another China attack scenario. But you know, the last um, probably big uh, disruptive uh, routing leak was several years ago with the Allegheny Tech leak. This is good news that it's been so long. Uh, in that case, you had a route optimizer introducing uh, routes. So the leak was about 29,000 routes. The route optimizer only announced, only created about 200 more specifics. Uh, but those more specifics were to major content providers, uh, Cloudflare and Con uh, Akamai. Uh, they ended up being uh, the most most impacted, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, these are um, 
especially problematic because uh, the origins, uh, I've gotten a couple examples here of the go leaked Google uh, path, leaked Cloudflare path, the origins are intact. So checking the origin of these routes does you no good. Um, in the case of the Allegheny Tech, RPKI would have helped, but only because of the routes were uh, more specifics coming from that route optimizer and because Cloudflare had, had set their max prefix length in the row as to match how the routes were uh, in cir uh, circulated. So that would have rendered them invalid and had Verizon been dropping invalids, it would have, would have uh, helped. But um, otherwise, uh, to, to battle this, we need uh, the ASPA, which you may have heard uh, a little about. So someone might uh, throw up their hands and say, hey, this, this bridging gap protocol uh, thing is just hopeless. Um, and I'm here to defend it. I think it works uh, pretty well. You know, honestly, if you, a lot of these outages that get blamed on BGP, BGP is really the, uh, uh, it's really the, the symptom. There's some other, you know, in the Facebook outage, a Rogers outage in Canada, uh, the BGP was what we can all, we can all look at this and see, uh, see that this is, the, this is happening, these routes are getting withdrawn, but uh, it's more of a symptom than the cause. Uh, there are inherent weaknesses in the protocol, but um, I think it, sometimes it gets a bad rap. And then, yeah, B bridging gap protocol, where did they get that? Like, oh no, oh, it wasn't me. So. As I said earlier, like, ask yourself, when was the last uh, debilitating BGP routing leak? These leaks still take place. They take place on a regular basis, but we're a lot better at surviving them than we used to be. Are our fingers getting less fat? No, they're not. So um, there's some progress to be made, and we heard a little about this with the last talk from Augustine. Um, so you have these tier ones that are dropping in ballads. Uh, a lot of them, in fact, we're down to just a couple that aren't, and they have plans to get there. So when we get to the point where all of the, uh, the TFZ providers are dropping invalids, it'll be a tr tremendous milestone. Uh, that's uh, an argument also, if you haven't already, to create rows for your address space because it will uh, protect your, uh, uh, your, your, your routes in the event of a, a origin leak or a, you know, one of these other scenarios. So this is a, uh, a graph, and maybe a little hard to read the yellow, but um, <clears throat> this is from NIST. This is a, another a US federal agency. We have a lot of them. Uh, this, this is a technical standards group that studies a variety of topics, and one of them, they have a routing security group that's really great, and uh, they pub publish this website that has all kinds of statistics around you know, where we are about RPKI, and it gets updated every day. It has these uh, temporal you know, t time series uh, announcements and you can, uh, of graphs, and you can see that in this case, uh, the number of routes that are unknown are going down. This is from last year. It's gotten even um, better. Probably within, uh, I don't know, maybe within six months, these lines may cross, where we have more uh, routes with uh, valid rows than unknowns. That's amazing. Uh, we've really made a lot of progress there. And because of those uh, ROAs, uh, there are so many routes with ROAs, that ought to be motivation for dropping invalids. Because what that's, what's that gonna do for you is that's gonna protect how you egress traffic. It's gonna protect your traffic. There's something in it for you to reject, to, uh, reject those invalids. So I did a talk in Nanog last year where I, I, I thought at the time, and it's gotten a lot better since, uh, you know, we only had about one third of routes, whether V4 or V6, it doesn't matter, uh, had, had ROAs. Um, and I wanted to look, so I work at a company that we have a lot of NetFlow data uh, from our uh, customers and we can kind of throw that into a pool and just say, hey, across all of our very large provider uh, customers, uh, which includes some massive telecoms, uh, if we could assess across the internet how much traffic is going to routes with valid ROAs or unknown, or basically the two main categories, there's a very small amount of persistently invalid stuff. It turned out that the majority of traffic was going to this minority of uh, BGP routes with, uh, with ROAs. And so that's, um, again, we're, we've, we've made more progress than we thought. Uh, the reason being is that uh, you had major content providers, whether it's Google, Amazon, uh, Akamai, uh, there's probably some others that have done RPI deployments. So the, the, the content providers doing that, and then you have a lot of access layer or eyeball networks in the United States, this is Comcast and Spectrum. Uh, other countries have got uh, deployments as well for their um, eyeball networks. That accounts for a lot of traffic, more than the number of just the raw count of routes. So we'd actually made more progress than we, um, we thought. And then 
Um, the other question, you know, there, there's two parts to RPKI working. You have to, number one, the address owner has to create the ROA, and then networks have to reject the invalids. And so it's, ROAs alone are useless if, if nobody's uh, rejecting invalids. So there has to be some rejection. I mentioned earlier this, uh, these tier ones rejecting invalids, and that translates into a, a big downward benefit uh, towards the internet. And so this, these graphs are looking at route views data, <clears throat> where I take uh, all the tables of all the peering sessions and look at how many of the peering sessions saw each route um, based on its status of RPKI not found, valid, uh, invalid. So on the, the y-axis is uh, counts of BGP sources from route views, uh, and then the, um, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the y-axis is counts of prefixes, the, uh, uh, the x-axis is uh, peers. So you have this um, a route, where, where globally routed uh, routes are, there's a, there's a peak, and then uh, if you go down to the invalid routes, you cannot have a globally routed invalid route anymore. It just doesn't work. In fact, you can expect if it, when a route changes from valid or unknown to invalid, the propagation is going to drop by 50% or even more. It depends who the upstreams are. Uh, but this is a huge penalty, and this is the system working. This is how it's supposed to work. Uh, the, when there is something invalid, we want to suppress it, so it uh, uh, causes the minimal amount of disruption. So if you take nothing away, there's two truths here. Uh, we have the majority of traffic going to RPK valid routes. Route propagation is cut in half or, or better uh, with, uh, when a route is determined to be invalid. And then on up to the other end of the spectrum, I mentioned at the beginning, we've got the bonehead errors, and then we've got this determined adversary scenario that's very difficult to address. And this is probably where folks who do a lot of thinking about this need to be spending their time less on the bonehead errors, more on the, um, uh, the difficult, difficult stuff. So this is um, live shots of people BGP hijacking. So we, um, uh, in you know, 2008, there was this black hat talk that theorized uh, BGP being used for a man in the middle attack. It was a couple years later the, when I was at Renesis, we had spotted what we think is the first man in the middle BGB attack uh, in the wild, uh, something coming out of Belarus, attacking US financial institutions and uh, a number of government networks around the world. Um, but lately, the target has been cryptocurrencies. Uh, this is a terrific thing for bad guys to try to attack. Uh, a lot of these services have got um, uh, you know, every, everything's got some weakness. I, I don't want to uh, put them down too much, but um, uh, if you can steal some cryptocurrency and they, you're, you've got, you can, uh, there's no recourse. You can just take it, you're gone. Uh, and so it ends up being a, a very attractive target for sophisticated attackers. And there's just uh, a steady drumbeat of attacks that keep coming. So I'll just mention, you know, there was uh, way back in uh, April 2018, this uh, Route 53 hijack. Uh, that redirected uh, my Ether wallet. Um, I talked about this actually at a, a previous LACNIC. Uh, that was followed by another uh, attack a couple months later uh, for um, a, a hijack of a authoritative DNS for payment processors. You know, earlier last year, so the beginning of last year, there was this clay swap attack in South Korea where there was a BGB hijack, not of the cryptocurrency itself, but the attackers have figured out that the cryptocurrency service loaded a library from another hosting provider in South Korea. So they uh, hijacked that to be able to uh, load a malicious version of the library. And then once that was loaded, uh, they could take control of the, the uh, cryptocurrency and steal it. It's kind of a supply chain uh, BGB hijack. Um, and then, uh, you know, Mo the most recent one that we have a lot of information on there uh, is Seller Bridge from last year, although there's this, uh, there was an attack against Balancer just a, a couple weeks ago. We're still kind of, I'm still working with some people trying to pull out the details of, uh, there was a BGB hijack around the time. It's unclear what was the role, but for Seller Bridge, I think we understand uh, this, um, this case. So this is a, a service that helps users convert uh, between cryptocurrencies. Um, the attacker used a BGB hijack against AWS, so uh, they had, uh, this is a very um, brave, uh, brave attack. Uh, they were able to impersonate part of the Celebridge infrastructure and redirected, uh, redirect uh, digital assets from the attacker. And so in order for this to be successful, they had to um, 
uh, insert bogus route objects into AltDB. Uh, so they had figured out that uh, this provider in the UK, QuickHost, uh, used Aurelion for transit, and that Aurelion had an automated process for uh, slurping up various uh, RIR information to build an automated whitelist for filtering. Uh, they realized that AltDB was one of the sources, and AltDB, uh, the security wasn't very tight. I'm not sure where it stands now. Um, but uh, these attackers were able to trick these guys into adding a, a, ref, uh, a record so that uh, Quick Host could be, a, a trans, could be transiting uh, uh, AWS uh, address space, which is kind of uh, unusual. And so then they started announcing um, and hijacking uh, uh, Amazon address space. Uh, this was a graphic I had made um, looking at just this in this graphic on the X, the y-axis is uh, how far a route propagated, in this case, it's going to 100%. They announced uh, a more specific uh, that went global uh, it, on over multiple periods of time. Um, there were multiple uh, uh, attacks where they were stealing money. Uh, Amazon didn't announce an identical slash 24 until an hour after the attack was over. Uh, in the meantime, the attackers are, were long gone with, with the money. And so, uh, in this case, uh, Amazon had um, ROAs for their address space. So why did that not help in this scenario? So I guess uh, there, there may be some differences of opinion here, but I, um, when I looked at this last year, I said, you know, look at, look, if you look at the ROAs uh, that Amazon creates, they're very liberal. Uh, they allow three different Amazon ASs to announce parts of this, uh, this address space, ranging in prefix size from a slash 10 to a slash 24. So there's a lot of room there for an attacker to come up with something more specific that uh, could sneak in. You know, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the Allegheny Tech leak, RPK would have helped in that case because the ROA, um, the uh, max prefix length set on the ROAs matched the, uh, uh, how the routes were announced. Um, if, if Amazon had been doing the same thing, then the attacker would have to be in contention with Amazon, and they probably wouldn't, uh, those routes probably wouldn't go very far uh, if they had to compete with uh, Amazon's uh, peering base. I would mention also that uh, after this, there was a RFC uh, 9319 um, that was published, uh, making the case that you know, the, the max prefix length field in the ROA is optional, and that's not well known, uh, that you can leave that off. And that you're uh, that if you do that, then uh, you're basically checking against the origin, and that the uh, it assumes that the max prefix length is essentially the same as the route that's in circulation. So that is a uh, something to consider. You can you can you can just leave that field out. So uh, ultimately, what we'll need, and we don't have right now, uh, is uh, some kind of BGP sec uh, to eliminate the impersonation of ASs in these scenarios. Um, now, the, there's a there's a, a lot of um, uh, critique of of how we would even be able to do uh, BGP sec. There's a, a cryptographical uh, computational cost to it. Um, and I guess uh, also the protection will only uh, extend to the contiguous BGP sec aware ASs. As soon as you break the chain, if a route's propagating from AS to AS, as soon as one doesn't know, uh, doesn't use BGP sec, you've lost uh, you know, the, uh, any security that was gained. Having said that, there's still a uh, benefit in a partial deployment. Um, if we have a very consolidated internet, you know, we have lots of big providers, lots of big cloud providers, not that many, um, but those that exist have the wherewithal to potentially uh, field something like this. And if you had, in this case, had Aurelion and uh, Amazon, had uh, two companies that would have the resources and sophistication to deploy uh, BGBSEC if it were ready to be deployed, you know, if they would, Aurelion would, would prefer a cryptographically signed announcement for, directly from Amazon versus one from uh, QuickHost that didn't, uh, uh, didn't, wasn't signed then that would, have, that would have helped here, but we don't, today, we don't have that yet. It's something that's uh, still under discussion. So, you know, we have a lot more progress uh, to come. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of successes. We should take a moment to uh, um, congratulate ourselves on, I know there's a lot of work, a lot of people in this room probably were also involved in, in improving uh, things of where we are today. Um, 
we still have stuff we need to, to solve, especially for this determined adversary scenario, and these attacks against cryptocurrency services are demonstrating the weaknesses uh, of the areas that we need to, to uh, shore up. ASPA is something um, in, in the works. You may hear a little about that. Um, and uh, you know, there's a, a certain routing security evangelist who makes his way around. You've probably heard of this guy, and he'll uh, happy to talk your ear off uh, on this stuff. So I would say that we are uh, moving the needle on towards the uh, uh, determined adversary. Things have improved a lot. We've got a lot of work still to do, but things have gotten a lot better. And um, vamos. This is my cross stitch. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, my question is to know uh, your opinion on those software optimizers or BGP optimizer softwares. Yes. Do, do you think that they create more harm than good or is a safe way to use it? Uh, or how do you think about that? Um, I think the people who are in the circles that I'm in they don't like uh, introdu 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 introduction of new, more specifics because uh, it risks you know, leaking out and causing problems. So I think, um, uh, so we're talking about noxion here. Uh, and I, I guess another issue is that by def I, I, don't, I guess I don't know where the, I think in 2019, I know there's a discussion, I don't know where they stand now, but by default, there wasn't a, uh, um, like a no export, um, you had to you had to put on the no export or something, uh, and and that was really just playing with fire because uh, if someone announces these more specifics, then it's going to cause a problem. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe they fixed that. I mean, honestly, we haven't had that many issues lately, and people still use uh, Noxion for route optimization. Um, but I guess as a as a BGP purist, uh, it um, that kind of stuff bothers me because I worry about it, uh, it screwing up uh, the internet, but. Um, and maybe maybe it's gotten better. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Doug. Roas. See. Up to a slash 32. What do you think about that? I Sorry, can you re repeat that scenario? Yes, the scenario is big transit provider asking for you to sign your ROAS with a max length of 32. A max length of what is it? IPv4. IPv4, IPv4. Slash, uh, slash 32. Oh, okay. If not, they are going to reject your slash 32 that you're trying to if you, so if you, if you don't set your max prefix length to 32 right. for a IP, IPv4 IPv4 yes then they won't uh trans wow that's that sounds terrible <laughs> so just, <laughs> just to let you know what's going on with I can give you the, the name. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I give these talks around the world. I do, I do hear, I, I haven't heard that scenario. Um, I do hear, you know, there's, there's a few um, uh, things that are, 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 are difficult. Like it, all this works in, in theory, but then you end up with uh, other, other scenarios are like a, mm -hmm. um, like a DDoS mitigation provider uh, may want to be able to inject uh, more specifics into a, into a network mm -hmm. in order to help it out. This is, you know, consensual. They're trying to attract traffic out of uh, the network. Well, if it, if it um, rejects invalids, those more specifics uh, won't, Get circulated, so it has to create a, a way for those those uh, invalid routes to then go around RPI. I don't know. There are, I know of a, a number of scenarios where. Um, yeah. No, I'm, I'm telling you this because it was one of the big transit providers. You mentioned that. Hey, we have our PKI. Ah, okay. All right. Well, afterwards this, you can tell me some yeah. more about that scenario. Yeah, I'd like to hear about it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yes. 
cuestión en la cual puedas necesitar anunciar una ruta muy específica para hacer un black hole para el upstream. ¿Cuál sería la, el diseño apropiado de la sesión de BGP? Porque, por otro lado, They are going to reject it because it's invalid. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure what the solution is to that. That's, 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 that's the scenario I was describing here, also with a, a like a, a you know like a DDoS mitigation provider, like Prolexic will do this uh, on occasion uh, as one of their mechanisms for for black holing traffic. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not I'm not sure what the the best the good solution for that is. Because we were discussing this with Thomas a couple of weeks ago, and we didn't come up with anything better either. Yeah. So, uh, so my question, my second question is, uh, what are your thoughts on ASPA? Do are we going to need both BGP sec and ASPA, or uh, yeah, perhaps we I can think so. I think because they do different things. Uh, so ASPA is uh, <laughs> this is where ASs will assert who are their transit providers, and that enables others who are doing this checking to look for validity violations in the AS path. And um, uh, yeah, I think for BGP sec, we're probably never going to have enough adoption, even in a, uh, a great scenario. It's never going to be a long ass path of all BGP sec. Uh, so that's, it's really going to be end up uh, securing sessions directly, probably, is how it's going to work. Um, so you're going to need this uh, um, something to, to look for errors, leak errors in the AS path. And, uh, and so right now, The only solution we've got is uh, ASPA, and so I would, I would, if you're not familiar with it, um, please read up on it. You can start asserting you know, who are your transit providers into the system, and that enables others to uh, reject routes that um, violate the relationships that you've uh, put in the system. But I think we'll need both. So much. Thank you so much. And uh, if oh, sorry. Uh, Question of Thomas. Nombre, nombre y... Sorry, my name is Douglas from Brazil. Uh, Thomas, that kind of positions of those providers takes the, uh, the, the, the situation to a third level of issues, if you understand me. <laughs> But uh, uh, asking about that, uh, uh, one of the solutions that we consider to, uh, when we are deploying the solutions for that kind of validation of black hole is to break the, a bit the protocol uh, and doing uh, rejection based on the motivation of the invalid scenario. This is invalid because of the mask or this is invalid because of the crypto. This is invalid. So uh, I deployed some scenarios that where I break it a bit the RTM client and say, If it is invalid, if it's a slash 32 or more specific, and is it is invalid by mask, it is acceptable. Okay. A scenario for remote triggered black hole. What do you think about that? I'd have to think about that. Uh, I, I see why that would work for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you're you are kind of removing. It's a trade-off there. You're, you're trading off uh, uh, one of the potential security benefits, uh, but for you know, the practical operations of the network. Um, I don't, I'd have to think about that, uh, but I understand why. Okay. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? You, you, you're... Yeah, uh, on, on RTR client, you have the motivations specific. Okay. So you treat that, and uh, on the ifs, uh, you need to use... Uh, You, I, I was not. I was just able to do that with Perch because on other customers, on other uh, engines, I couldn't treat the the messages. So in Bird, I took the message, and we on the ifs that you can do okay. whatever, whatever. I see. Uh, I did it because, but uh, on that scenario that we are we were deploying, we had a route server specific for black hole not on the same session on the normal prefixes. So I could do almost anything that I, I needed, but uh, it's a different scenario. I see. All right, thanks. Thank you. Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, ahora sí, un enorme aplauso para Doug. And thank you very much for thanks. coming.